Mm -hmm. Go for it. So welcome everybody to tonight's Clearly Cannabis. Uh, my name is Marguerite Arnold. Uh, I am a journalist, uh, a geek entrepreneur, and work in the cannabis space here in Germany as an expat and rapidly becoming citizen. Uh, with us tonight, we of course have uh, the ever cool and epionymous um, <laughs> Patrick Dowdy, and of course Martin Weller. And our guest tonight, which we are very, very delighted to announce, of course, is um, is uh, Francis Scanlon who is the founder and CEO of Cloud9 Switzerland, which is a fascinating CBD company that we're going to be discussing tonight. So welcome, Francis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you're welcome. And we just, you know, we've known each other for several years now. And uh, I think tonight is going to be a really cool uh, conversation. For those of us who, those of you who are joining us for the first time, we have some questions that we're going to ask Francis, and then we're going to open this up also to other questions from you, should you have them. So the idea is to create uh, thought leadership and interaction as well um, for those people who have questions. So let me just jump right into all of this. Um, Francis, can you tell us briefly about your path into the cannabis industry mm -hmm. so far? What inspired you uh, mm -hmm. to enter it in 2017 <laughs> and from Switzerland? What was your first product? You mm -hmm. know, give us, give us the skinny. Mm -hmm. The, the, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, it's a long story, but I'll try to be brief. Otherwise, I'll, I'll take up the whole hour talking about it. Um, we have to go back to 2016, actually, 2015 and 16, because I was living in Jamaica at the time. I was there representing my Italian company I was working for in the rum business. And I had a light bulb moment in January. I remember it very well. It was a Friday late afternoon. I was sitting with a friend, having a beer, and I was thinking about what was going on in Jamaica at the time, because they had changed the legislation to allow for the medical use of cannabis and also to decriminalize the personal consumption. So it, raised, it rang bells in my mind, because in my past life, I used to be the scientific director for a phytopharmaceutical company for phytotherapy and homeopathy in Switzerland. So I, I, I have a background in medicinal plants. And um, I could see that the Jamaicans were kind of at the beginning of their, of their adventure. And I thought it was, a, for me, a very nice opportunity. It, it spoke to me immediately as a good business opportunity where I could leverage my skill set and my experience. That's how I got into it. So one year fast forward in 2017, um, that's when I founded the company in July. It was registered in July. And the Italian company I was working for at the time, I left them at the end of August. And then I've been dedicating myself to this adventure since 1st of September 2017. Happily. So what, what, what was your first product? Come on. Brag about it, Willy Wonka. Oh, the first product. No, the, the, so, no, okay. So, you know, I'm a cautious individual, very methodical in my approach. And I'm, and I'm thinking, back then, I was thinking to myself, how can we do something really value-added? And I'm not interested in cultivation or processing, because that's not really my skill set. Uh, my skill set is really more in the development of premium products, yeah, product development, regulatory compliance, and doing something that can really benefit people, really, really benefit consumers, not just marketing, blah, blah, blah. I'm a technical person by, by training. I'm a chemist, actually, originally. And um, what I was thinking of at the time, I was, I was basically laying down a foundation and, and figuring out what would be perfect for us. So we did, we did two things. Uh, one, we launched a project to develop a Swiss chocolate containing hemp extract, containing CBD, natural CBD. Yeah? And the second thing we did to put some meat and potatoes on the, on the table at the end of the month was to start distribution of American hemp products from uh, a company in Colorado. Okay. So we started doing that distribution and started sales actually in the beginning of 2019. It took a while to, to, to get it going, but we got it going and we've created a nice name for ourselves in the Italian market, particularly, 
And that also allowed us to enter and see what the consumer sees, you know, and see what the patients see and see what the, you know, the, the, re the real people who are benefiting from this whole industry, what they see and put ourselves in their shoes. And that, and that was really important for us because we, you know, oh, I'm coming from a from different background and we wanted to understand what we were getting into basically. Yeah. So in parallel, we're doing distribution. We're developing uh, nutraceuticals, let's call them, starting with the Swiss chocolate. And then a little while later, we started to do, uh, back to my, my, uh, my first love of spirits, um, we developed a, a cannabis gin and a cannabis rum in Jamaica. Yeah, that was in the beginning of 2018. It was a very nice experience. Yeah. Uh, and then we actually replicated it at a distillery in Canada, in Alberta, in anticipation of uh, the change in laws, change in regulations uh, in October of last year, which, by the way, killed us because we couldn't do what we wanted to do. Yeah. Well, well, I'm I'm coming back to that in a second. There are a couple of follow-ups, but I, I think I want to lead on, you know, in this conversation because you're talking about issues in the industry, right? Starting with the pandemic, what has been your mm -hmm. experience in an industry that some people are calling COVID-proof, some people are calling COVID-affected? You know, what in your experience, what has it, what has COVID been? Um. Let's, let's go back earlier this year. At the beginning of this year, we had the first effect, which was the fallout from the stock markets in Canada. You, which was you'll probably what? remember that, that, that bubble, you know, all the speculation behind all the Canadian cannabis companies, the share prices, and then that bubble burst. That burst at the end of last year, and that ran into the beginning of this year. What that, what that did was dry up liquidity in the market. So investors got scared. They were no more interested in, in cannabis or hemp or anything like that. And that had a knock-on effect over here in Europe as well, because you know we were in we were in discussions at that time with the Canadian company, but then their investors decided not to not to follow through, which was unfortunate. Um, and then came COVID in February, so it was like uh, you know a two-punch knockout. <laughs> Really, and and you know, for small companies like us, and for a lot of companies in this new industry, because it is a, it is really a new industry, it revealed the vulnerabilities. It really brought them to life. Huh? Where we're for the most part small companies, uh, family-owned companies, or some have have investors behind them, uh, but nonetheless, it's 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 new and it's weak. It's not established like, you know, the big pharma, the big agriculture, the big food producers. It's not there yet. So uh, that presented a lot of issues, a lot of problems. I mean, our main market is the Italian market. We, we sell into retail channels, uh, direct to sales into retail. All our, all our customers had to close their doors for three months. So how, were three online, months how were online sales? No I'm orders. Sorry, no orders at all, not even so online. Those... So those, no, no, they could, those who were equipped to do online, and that's the minority in, in that market, they could continue until they ran out of stock. And then came the next problem, was how to restock when I can't cross the border. Yeah? And I can't get anyone to do it. And couriers weren't transporting. Yeah, so how, did, how did you solve the problem? We couldn't. We couldn't, so no orders, no deliveries. For but you're more still than three smiling. Months. But you're still smiling. Uh, we're back. To, we're we're coming back now. We're coming back. I am smiling because I, I I remain positive in my outlook because I know the fundamentals of this business are right. They're good. They're solid. So I know we're passing a bad time right now, but it will it will come good again. And and in June, our customers started coming back to us. We started receiving some small orders, and it's it's getting back. It's picking up again. So you think this was a temporary blip because it just hit everybody, but now well, how do you see the cannabis industry specifically, starting with you, responding so this kind of thing doesn't happen again or as badly? Well, um, it's important. Uh, first, number one, online. 
you mentioned the keyword online sales. I think now going into the future, we need to be much better at our at our digital presence and our digital sales channels because that's going to be something that will save us if if we get another issue like this again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and what uh, are the having, challenges with selling online? Uh, regulatory, I would say, is a, is a, is a challenge. Uh, you need to be careful and you need to have the right legalities in place so that you don't run up against any issues where products are sold in a market where that product may not be authorized, but you as the supplier, you're not you know, dealing with the, the individual who has to take the responsibility of what they're ordering. So basically, the, the responsibility is, on, is in their hands. Um, and in, in that case, then what can happen is that products get blocked at the borders, you know, and get impounded and, and issues can be created because of that. So you have to be careful. Um, I don't want to talk about novel foods, not unless you want to talk about it, <laughs> because that's another big issue. That's a separate, that's a separate several hours. That's a, that's a whole chapter all by itself. Yeah. It is, it is. But on that, on that note, I mean, I found in, to that they're, point. They're, 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 you connect with legislation there. My argument on legislation, it really runs into that. Yeah. It is legislation, but I think it's also going to be, as I said, I found a, a very nice whole stack of bottles of hemp oil in Riva. With EU bio on it. Oh, that's this right. Week. In a supermarket chain. In a right? supermarket. supermarket. So that, that was my kind of my next question to you is yes, the regulations, yes, there's labeling, yes, there's supply chain issues. But do you think with these moments of interesting lights that appear to all of us, you know, you see a CBD product, you're like, oh, that the market is just going ahead anyway. I mean, sure, there are people who might be might get stopped, but people seem to just be going ahead. Is that your experience? Or not? Uh, yeah, people are going ahead. Yeah, and um, there is um, there is a market there. That, there's consumers. There's demand from consumers. Like I said earlier, the fundamentals of the business are, are right. Uh, you have demand from consumers. Uh, the products, if properly formulated and properly labeled, uh, are safe for consumer. That's the that's the most important thing. Safe and compliant. In terms of that and you know earlier you know we had like you said rays, rays of lights rays of sunshine in february this year we had the uk fsa who came out with a nice statement saying okay all the operators on the market with cbd products you're allowed to continue as long as you're safe and compliant in your labeling and we give you up until the end of march next year to apply for your novel foods status okay that was nice that, that was a good gesture i thought on behalf of the fsa unlike what the eu has just done recently where they came out and released their preliminary legal opinion that it's that CBD is a narcotic, a ridiculous statement, totally ridiculous. And and then you know with the immediate reaction from the European Industrial Hemp Association, who who you know mounted starting to mount pressure at the EU level, um, but. I haven't seen anything, any light on the horizon right right now from the EU. The EU, the EU are quite quite uh, confused, I would say. <laughs> well, that that, mm -hmm. that that sort of leads into the next question. There are lots of regulatory bugbears in the room. Is there one in particular that the industry should be focusing on, or is it a juggling act, or is it the one that you happen to be focused on now? How do you deal with it? Um, you you got to differentiate between uh, truly medical, pharma, and food, and cosmetic as well. Cosmetic is, is a bit easier. Um, but, but food is the big issue today uh, in Europe. If, we, if I talk about Europe, it's the big issue. In the States, too, because, you know, the FDA have come out uh, as well uh, regarding CBD products, yeah? Not hemp, but CBD, right? It's different. So that... that that still needs a lot of clarity, and there's a lot of confusion around that. A lot of confusion today. Um, you, you know, we have we have opposite sounding bells from the EU. Back in May, the Advocate General uh, Tanchev he ruled in favor of a French cannabis company um, 
who was commercializing CBD products in France, right? You know about it. So Big he case. ruled that, that um, what the French courts had done was illegal and was preventing free trade within the EU member states. And so that gave hope that CBD products, it, it gave a positive, a positive um, uh, sound of the bells for CBD products. But then, what, a month after that, you had th this uh, preliminary legal opinion from the European Commission coming out and saying that CBD products are narcotics, and because they're narcotics, then they can't be uh, uh, considered for novel food applications. And all the companies who had made applications received nice notices that uh, their applications are not going to be considered. But it's not going to stop and there. Then, and, 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 and then, you know, in, in a couple of months, in December, we have the, the Narcotics Commission meeting, the UN Narcotics Commission, the NC, what is it called, NCD? They're, they're meeting in um, Vienna, yeah. right? And hopefully there will be an interesting vote that has been put off for more than a year. Mm -hmm. uh, Two, actually. On the WHO recommendations, yeah? Yeah. But, but that's for medical. So th that's... that's that's the thing that needs to be cleared up. You've got good things happening on the medical front, and you have confusion on the whole, you know, food, beverage, uh, nutraceutical CBD front, right? It's total confusion in Europe anyways. Yeah? Well, so let's, let's change the tenor of the tone and switch to mm -hmm. a, 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 a beautiful dream. What, in a perfect world, what would you see happening in Europe, or what do you see happening on the CBD front? Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in six months, but 18 months, 24 months, 36 months down the road. Well, I, I mean, the, um, we, we could go back to the pre-January 2019. Pre-January 2019, before the EU uh, modified the Novel Foods Catalog with their, their entries, um, I mean, since 1998, uh, there were letters from the European Commission saying that it was fine, that it wasn't a novel food to use the leaves and the flowers of the hemp plant containing CBD. As long as the THC levels were no more than 0.2%, you're fine. All right? As long, there were three conditions. Back, back, in, back in the nice days of 2017, 2018, I, I went to my regulators here in Switzerland. And I said, okay, what do I need to comply with? I went to them, right? Because I, I wanted to have good relations with my regulators. And um, they said, there's three things. One, the hemp has to be uh, EU certified. So it has to be on that list in Brussels. And now I think the list has 75 varieties of hemp plant. Two, it has to be a traditional extraction process. And three, no THC as well as compliant labeling and safe for consumption if it's a food product, which is food, the beginnings of food. Love. So that was nice. That was clear for me. I could work with that. And that's what we first developed our chocolate for. And then I had to reformulate it one year later to meet these new challenges coming from the EU uh, when they changed their entries in the, in the catalog, mm -hmm. which created even more confusion. All That's right. also expensive and time-consuming and terrible. Extremely, extremely, yeah. Did you have to dispose of product? I know a lot of farmers who have had to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Francis, you said that uh, on the cosmetic side, it's a little bit easier. Um, yes, because CBD is allowed as a topical product. So there's, it's not a regulated uh, ingredient. Okay, so even right. throughout the EU? Yes. Okay. There's an EU uh, cosmetics regulation uh, regarding that. And actually, there's even recent good news. In May, the EU came out with um, a statement that the use of extracts from cannabis sativa leaves, leaves and something else, seeds maybe, Le leaves for sure. It was leaves flowers, and a flower. Sure. It was leaves and flower. Right. It was leaves flowers, and flower. That's right are allowed in cosmetics because they have emollient properties and hydration properties known to be good for the skin. 
even right. with THC content or below, no, 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 not THC below, below no. 0.2 again, right? Yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's topical too, right? So then yes, there, there's topical. a whole discussion about ingestion. There's no THC. Right. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. But the use of CBD as a topical is not a problem. It's not a regulated substance. It, internationally, it's not a regulated substance. It's mm -hmm. not on the narcotic, the UN narcotics list, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What's on the list is cannabis and extracts, and resin and THC. That's what's on the list, mm -hmm. right? So it's a very complicated, you know, step-by-step -step process. But but here's the next one, and and this is sort of pos this is a sort of positive thing. And I, I I'm trying to use this phrase a lot. So so what if CBD is the garlic to the COVID vampire? What happens? <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, it's a very good anti-inflammatory. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's a good anti-inflammatory. So it's logical to think that it would have a positive effect. Mm -hmm. We know about the studies, right? I mean, there are now studies showing, there are three different but, studies, one from Israel, one from Canada, and there's another one yeah. going, that's starting to show that CBD has an, in, in, an anti-inflammatory effect and also mm -hmm. stops the storm of uh, inflammation. The fight of the exact. storm. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. So, so unfortunately, I, I early. Like see, it is right. early. And it I is like early. See comparative it is early. Uh, but let's just say, let's right. just say, let's just say that in 18 months or 24 months, these things begin to bear fruit. That's the, where I'm going with this question. Do How do you think that that discovery, if it happens, will impact the overall discussion which also, keep in mind, is moving. I mean, Luxembourg is coming at 2022. And if CBD is that's still out there hanging... That's recreational cannabis. That's yeah. right. No, but go, go, go back to the what's, the... what's the cutoff point between medical and non-medical? You know? In Europe, so my understanding I, I, is it has to be I, under 0.2%, correct? But would there also some states... That's, that's in the plant. That's in the plant. But then in different national legislations, they always hover around zero for THC content, 0, 0.0 something. Yeah. Depends on the country. I mean, recently Italy came up with 0 0.5. Well, Germany has a different system to begin with, right? So they have a list yeah. of medications for on the medical side with different THC mm -hmm. and CBD formulations. On the other side, mm -hmm. you know, the hemp legislation is you can't grow a crop more than 2%, right? And that's different from the U.S. I mean, that's a that's a separate question I want to get to. But let's just say, in a perfect world, this drug, whether it's COVID or another illness, right? What happens when this drug, through trials, which are going on right now, is suddenly elevated to another plane? Let's just use this but, theoretically. But but then it's going to be considered as a pharmaceutical, whether it's a prescription-based or a non-prescription-based product. It'll be a pharmaceutical in that case for the treatment of COVID, for the treatment of whatever um, disease. So then it will follow the, the traditional route for approval of pharmaceutical products. It and doesn't the, matter whether it's uh, cannabis or something else. So, so the end, I guess the answer to that question is, it doesn't matter how many medical marvels cannabis ends up being the panacea for, on the other side of the equation, whatever you want to call it, recreational, uh, wellness, there is a vast you know, open space with a lot of problems right now. But, that, but that's where we need to be very clear on the definition of a non-pharmaceutical product containing cannabis or containing a CBD extract or cannabis extract and what, what you're allowed to do. Because, again, you, you get into this whole debate that, we're, we're, you know, we're just talking about now with the, the legislation being very confusing and... Uh, and, and prevent in Europe at least preventing the industry from moving forward. Now, what, what that's also doing is that, and, and I think we said it earlier, there is consumer demand, and there's a lot of companies who are operating in the gray area. So that's proliferate. That's only going to proliferate and continue, and that's not to the benefit of the consumers. It's not to the benefit of the countries who want to get collect tax. Don't forget, there's a, there's a big interest from the, the, the different countries in the EU to collect their taxes. They all need taxes, especially now. They need, they need more taxes than ever before. Yeah. So, and, and, but don't um, those companies then, hurt you as well because they're not necessarily playing by the rules and therefore all CBD products sort of get lumped together? Whether Because, I mean, you're going through the process of, you know, proper labeling, making sure that you understand, you know, 
what you can and cannot represent. And then you have people coming into the market just sort of, you know, jumping into the market with no considerations. Um, and right. then the market itself gets tainted. That's right. That's what's happened over the last two years. And I understand why regulators might have a knee jerk reaction against all these CBD products proliferating everywhere with uh, maybe THC contents or CBD contents that have nothing to do with respecting what's on the label. Well, and they're also uh, making medical claims, right? Some of them. Right. And that, of course, you cannot do unless it's right. a, an approved medical product. Correct. So, Chris, yes. Do you see any solution to that or anything? That well, that's where I would love for clarity at the EU level to come out with clear regulations. So as to provide a solution to that, that then operators can comply with and then and then it's clear who who is you know out and who is in mm -hmm. and i think i think most of all consumers need to have that reassurance yeah well i mean i think that there is also the other discussion in this which you don't really deal with which is industrial hemp and that's leading us into the no. next discussion which is mm -hmm. the entire hemp discussion or the cannabis discussion is clearly on the agenda, or at least we've been writing about it, you know, at Candlelist EU lately, about how great the whole cannabis industry is for inclusion in what would be we call the Green New Deal, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, this is great for farmers. It's you know, there's thousands of farmers all over Europe who are you know, you know, developing cannabis crops as an alternative income. Mm -hmm. It's a great plant. It's an amazing plant. Yeah. And we've, seen evidence farmers. From the US, and we've seen evidence from the U.S. where there is job creation, right? We, you know, we've seen, you know, evidence right. from Colorado where, you know, they can generate a tax revenue, a significant tax revenue, um, right. allowing them to pay for education and things like that. So we have that model available from the economic development side that, you know, we would love to see, you know, the European legislators embrace because we think mm -hmm. this is a, you know, a great opportunity for economic development. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. And I think Europe uh, shouldn't be caught off guard and should at least start catching up with what's going on in North America. Francis, are you just- Particularly in the US space, yeah? And, and, not, and not recreate the problems of Canada. Francis, uh, do you see- anything? From my Canadian friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, Brent, do you see any, any, are you involved in trying to shape that opinion anyway, or do you see people that are effective in shaping that way, or are we just all observers up to now? Oh, um, you know, I've, I've got, I don't know, 20, 25 years of professional and industrial experience. I, I've worked on lots of regulatory committees in Brussels, been in Brussels, I don't know how many, many times. Um, but that was in the food industry, that was in the drinks industry, that was even in the tobacco and the water industry in my past lives. Um, in, in our industry, you know, outside of the European Industrial Hemp Association, it's, it's a weak industry in Brussels. There's not much going on in that front. And at an international level, I don't see a lot either. I see pockets, like in the States, there's different associations, uh, there's, there's, there's some movement there, um, but in Europe, uh, apart from the EIHA, we don't see much happening. So how do we and, change and that's, that? That's, how do we change that? Yeah, I agree with you. Now, I'm not involved. I'm, I'm, we're, we're members of the EIHA. We're members of the, um, the International Association of Cannabinoids for Medicine. And we're also in, uh, members of the, the Swiss, Pharmace the Swiss um, Academy for Pharmaceutical Sciences. Those are the three associations we're members of. Um, so I'm happy to participate in those associations. Um, we're not hemp growers or cannabis growers, so we don't have much of a voice when it comes to the EIHA. Um, we're, we're downstream for them. So we're the people who are actually buying products for the, from their key members, their key membership. Um, but I mean, in, from, from an economic development perspective, it's not just farmers. It's everybody along that chain. No it's cannabis. The whole chain. It is. It's Correct. the whole chain. Right. It's the whole chain. Absolutely. And and this is a, again the demonstration of the, the weakness of this industry, this this new industry that it's not so well structured to defend itself and to have its voice heard where it should be. 
So you have been a very good fan, friend, uh, early supporter of our Canatech efforts. Um, mm -hmm, true. I'm going to be a little bit, a little bit self-promotional here. Why are you such a big fan about what we're doing on the regulation side? And well, you know, why do you think that find the certified company kind of services is going to be a, a, a big deal, like a needle in the haystack situation? Well, there you go. It's, it's a no-brainer question because uh, this industry is dying for, you know, trying for um, uh, transparency. We had too many scandals in the last year and a half. We've had too much uh, nonsense going on in the market where consumers are getting ripped off. Yeah, um, too many cowboys. So what you're doing is great because it's providing a platform where people can go find the certificates, the compliancy, the standards, the things that are required to really verify if that company is a bona fide company operating in the right way or where companies can go to get that information when they're looking at suppliers, potential suppliers, right? So I love that. I think that's great because where else am I going to go to get that information? I don't know anywhere else to get that information. I honestly don't. You're the only ones I know on the market who are providing that. So, so what is the industry going to do to self-regulate itself in this gap? Ah, good question. Very good question. And, and I think self-regulation is important. Um, and I think what we're going to see in the next, the next phase of this industry is where the, the cowboys and opportunists are going to change tack. They'll go off somewhere else. They'll get cut out. And the, and the trustworthy, the professional companies are the ones who are going to survive. They're the ones who are going to persist, yeah? How, how do, though, and I think this is a, a subject that is near and dear to your heart, how do you specifically, and take maybe one or two of your pet peeves, rogue players hurt the industry specifically? On, say, the consumer sorry, side. Sorry, could, you repeat, sure. could you repeat? How, I didn't get you. How do rogue players, and maybe you can pick one or two of your pet peeves. No, I'm how not going to mention rogue, anybody. I know, if just, 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 you know, in, as, as, a, as I would say, a subject matter discussion. How do mm. rogue players hurt those trying to follow compliance? I mean, for example, does it hurt consumers? Does it hurt oh, yes. the industry? Why does it yes, do that? Because, because, I mean, how many times do I have to, uh, I mean, I was in a, I was visiting a customer one month, a month ago here, just locally. And uh, a new, it was a new, um, a new channel I'm looking into, which, which are the health and beauty uh, spas, right? And the owner of the, it's a, it's a chain of beauty spas. And the owner, and, and they're very interested to put CBD cosmetics, especially in, the, in their stores. So, I mean, the first question out of her mouth was, you know, how can I trust this? I've heard so much uh, about uh, people getting, you know, ripped off at very expensive prices. And then inside the bottle, they just find olive oil, you know, things like this. So it's harming, it's harming us. And it makes my job a lot harder but I, I have to persist and I have to demonstrate that. And I don't mind that. And, that, and, and you know, what you're doing, uh, can it clear and can it, I mean, this is great mm -hmm. because that's how I can say, hey, go look here. You know, you can see, you can see the certificate of compliance, uh, and all of this that's needed to convince people in the trade. And so is the rest of the industry, you know, embracing that as, as an approach, like, you know, insisting, that the other players have this, or they're not quite there yet. I I, I request it when I when I I mean I, every week, every practically on a daily basis, I'm getting contacted by new suppliers from all over the world. And then you know if if I have an interest, there's the key question is all about quality and compliancy, and then will come price. Those those are my three top things. Yeah. So it has to tick those boxes, and if it doesn't, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into that. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely no shortage of people trying to sell product because, you know, I get pinged three or four times a day and I'm not even buying product and, and they're, they're pinging me, you know, so, so you know, there's definitely not a shortage of That's people right. trying to sell product. I don't know how reputable no. they are. And, you know, and I'm not so watching those boxes behind product. you. And, 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 and that's, that's the thing. When you, when, you, when, you, when you go back to them and say, okay, show, show me your, your certificates, Show me your lab reports. Uh, give me a sample. Uh, Russian changes. 
Okay. Well, let's talk about your international scope for a second. And I think that this is going to be very interesting for people to hear. You're actually importing from the United States and exporting to there. Can you talk a little bit about your international yes. U.S. adventures? Well, we're, we were the first, we were the, sure, we were the first to import American produced hemp products into, into the EU. And it just, at first it was into Switzerland. And then, um, yeah, then because of the issues in our main market, the Italian market, with the, the former Minister of the Interior, who decided he didn't like uh, hemp stores and the hemp business, and told all his customs officials to block everything coming across the border, then we set up a company in France. So then we started importing into France. So we've imported successfully American-produced products into both Switzerland and into France and in the EU. And we have sold them without any problem in the EU. And we have also been controlled by the, the authorities, both in Switzerland and in Italy. And everything has come back clean. Um, in terms of our declarations, our product codes, uh, how, how the, the products are declared to customs, everything is compliant. We have all the certificates in place. So we, we've been able to demonstrate that effectively and we've not had any issues. I have had um, shipments blocked pending control, you know, which, which of course is uh, it's not nice to tell a customer when he's out of stock, he's got to wait. But um, that's, that's life, so we have to deal. Um, exporting now from here to the States, we are going to start in uh, production will be the end of September. We're gonna have Swiss chocolate going to California starting in October. Awesome, congratulations. Yeah. It's going to October and going to Australia. Very cool. We have a, a very nice um, partner in Brisbane who uh, is uh, helping us to get into the pharmacy channel in Australia, pharmacies and health food stores. Awesome. So we're looking forward to that. We have different products that are compliant to each market hmm. because we had to change our labeling, our formulation to, to meet the compliancy, but we did. And are you buying from the US because of quality? Yes, actually, great products. Yeah, I mean, the, the, and, and, and they were new to the European market. And this is one of the things we also pride ourselves on because we were the first to bring in um, CBN, CBD, CBN, a combination of both uh, oils and also uh, cosmetic products like Roll-Ons. Roll-Ons didn't exist at the time in the year. Now they do. There's another one or two companies doing Roll-Ons. But at that time, we were the first to do a Roll-On um, containing hemp, hemp extract with CBD. Um, and, and that was attractive and that opened a lot of doors in the retail channel for us because at that time CBN, we were the first with CBN. So that was new. Uh, our customers wanted it. Consumers wanted to try it. They had great experience with it and it sells fantastically. Really does. It's, it's high demand. So at this point, I'd like to ask anybody, we have a, a couple of new visitors on here. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Patrick has actually asked anybody in the group chat, if you do have a question or comment, please post it and we will introduce you into the conversation. But I want to continue a little bit more about this very, very interesting, I think you're the first person I know who has not only imported here, but has exported to the United States. Beyond, I would now we're say- we're going to export. October. You're going to export, going to, okay. Going but that, to, that I would is, love to do process. Canada, by the way, but I can't do Canada. Why not? Why not? <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the regulations won't allow it. They won't okay. allow uh, only uh, medical or scientific use uh, product. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's hemp or whether it's cannabis, it doesn't matter. But the laws are very restrictive. Uh, even between the provinces, they're very restrictive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Uh, which I discovered, and uh, I was I was I had high hopes that with the the modification of the of the legislation last October we would be able to import our Swiss made chocolate uh, with hemp mm -hmm. into Canada. But the lawyers came back and they said, mm -mm, "You can't do it. It has to be produced in Canada." Okay. So it's quite uh, quite uh, a protective uh, market to get into. 
especially because the Canadians are sending here. I think that that's very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, and I that think wasn't rather unfair. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's my next question, though. I guess the the trade, the CETA trade, I thought opened that up, but maybe it was just not just not for pharmaceutical products. Maybe it was for everything else, but that's interesting. Mm. But I, I, but food so products, I, I can't do. So CETA is, isn't a blanket. Uh, there's a vast amount of rate things that are in there that are uh, uh, um, you know trade uh, uh, for free trade. But it's not a blanket uh, uh, free trade deal, deal that covers every single thing. For sure. And what I think is just interesting about this is that, you know, I think clearly on this side of the ocean, there was a lot of discussion about CETA being involved in the lawsuits around the bid and that whole discussion. But it's interesting going the other way that there is such a protectionist market around cannabis that also does not appear to exist in the United States, too. That's fascinating. No, no. We can go to the States. Um... Hemp is legal, federally legal. That's what we do. And, and again, there's no THC in our products. Why did you pick California of all the states, the biggest market or? It's the most attractive one for us. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's also where you... I grew up when I was a child. <laughs> well, how did, what, what, were the, what were the sort of checklist items that you used to say California is the state that we want to enter beyond the historical affiliation for the real estate. We we, we worked with um, a very good uh, law firm in Los Angeles, who helped us in terms of um, verifying our product uh, formulation, our packaging, and um, explained very clearly to us what were the regulations that we had to comply with uh, in California state law. And uh, it was at the time when. Um, it was just, it was after the signing of the farm bill, which helped things a lot as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we picked California because uh, it's, a, it's one of the biggest markets for edibles, yeah? And um, we had a good contact with a Californian company, a cannabis company that, um, had a had a, a very nice distribution model to over 400 stores, and they wanted to stock our products in their stores and distribute it to the 400 stores they were also supplying to. Unfortunately, that company got into got into some uh, legal difficulties, and has since disappeared, which is another problem in this industry that you're you spend time and you invest a lot of resources and effort uh, building a partnership. Uh, with the company and then six months later they're gone you know is yeah. that true in Europe as well or is that mostly an American problem uh, I have so far encountered it with uh, the US yeah mainly yeah the US that's true uh, Francis not so much in Europe mm -hmm. yeah um you mentioned before that um, we're, you were just mentioning edibles and your chocolate in um, in Europe, and that you had to change the formulation. Was that to get it out of the novelty food? Um, yes, yes, yes. To to avoid, and and that's why I say pre two thousand nineteen, what we were doing was fully compliant. But after the change. Uh, in the interpretation of the legislation, even though we're still compliant with the legislation as it is written in, yeah. in, the, in the regulation, but the way it's been interpreted and translated into national legislations is uh, making life difficult for us. So to avoid issues, we, we did decide to reformulate so as to avoid any problems with novel foods. Yes. And when you go into, uh, into California, does that pretty much open the door to the other states for you because of sort of a scale? Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Correct. And this, and this is why we, we use California's first to get going, but then we will also go into other states and we have a, uh, another partner who will help us with um, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Francis, is it? Um, hello, first of all. <laughs> nice to, nice to Hi, see your, hear your voice again. Good to see you yeah. too. Yeah, it seems to be a lot of contradictions because just uh, just before we were shut down in, in March, um, you may know that you know, we have our cosmetics factory in, in the south of Spain here. 
And uh, we were told by mm -hmm. the, by the um, Spanish health ministry that absolutely CBD of any kind for topicals is not allowed in Spain. So question is, mm -hmm. uh, do, do national governments have the last word on this or does the they EU do. have the last word on this? No, the national government does. So. And, and, and that's where at EU level you have a cosmetics regulation that allows it, but then the, the individual member states, they have the right uh, on how they interpret that and how they translate that into their national law. And this is the big problem in the EU. And not just in our space, but in lots of different things that happen in the EU. It's very drives it to the US, right? We've had a lot of demand as well because we produce a lot of uh, you know, white label products and a lot of interest mm -hmm. from America as well. And we just, in Spain, the only way that we can produce anything with CBD in it is, is a, research, uh, a research agreement. A with research the or, right, right. Of course, it's, then, it's then you can't commercialize it, can you? Can't commercialize it, and it's extremely yeah. expensive. But your, na your neighbor's right next door in Portugal, the, one of the biggest white label cosmetics factories, if not the biggest in Europe, is located in Portugal, <clears throat> producing CBD cosmetics. Where, and where here's what's going to change. I happen to be in Porto at this very moment, so maybe if they're in Porto, uh -huh. Well, I think it's going to change. I, I really do, and the reason is because Spain has now started to, there are, there are two companies, at least that I know of, that have gotten approval to import GMP across the border. And my personal belief in Spain, and you know, Thomas, we can have we can have our discussions about this, but I believe that now that that has started, the Spanish will be under additional pressure to start to regulate the clubs, just like is happening in Holland, because it's not 20 years ago, it's not 10 years ago, and I they, mm. they're going to have to do something. They can't just mm. even the Dutch are saying we can't have you know unregulated grow, and they've now got they're searching, I think, or they've just come to the end of searching for 10 candidates to start that seed to sale supply chain. It's not gonna be uncontroversial. In Holland, the big cities like Amsterdam said, we don't wanna be a part of your trial, you know, go away. <laughs> but it definitely is coming. And I don't, I don't believe that Spain is gonna lag much behind this. I know that that is out there, out there for, a, you know, I guess we prediction, but just like France, just like any other- Well, country specifically right now, Spain, I mean, if, if it's not, sorry. Well, can I say, I mean, just, like, just like your previous, uh, our previous um, interview that we had, uh, we can, you can see it on YouTube shortly. Um, our, uh, um, the, the person that was interviewed at the time was describing the difference between the States and Europe. And basically, Europe basically is very methodical, very methodical, and you first crawl, you, and then slowly but surely, eventually learn how to walk, and then you run. And whereas in the U.S., it's basically people driven. So if the public wants something done, you change the legislation and then everything has to just run. There's no crawling, you have to run to catch up with it. And I think that there's some truth to that. I think there's a difference between the way things are happening in the US, which is much more people driven, demand driven. And in Europe where it's, it tends to be going very slowly, you don't, so I'm not so sure that any pressure that you would have in some of the states in the U.S., for instance, right now. I also think that there's a different mentality, whereas in the, in the states, if you can make money, everybody's for it. And I don't think that's necessarily a driving force in Europe. But I think it is going to continue to change because I don't think that, I mean, if you look at it, it, it may be that Spain lags behind, but I think that Denmark, I think that Holland, certainly Luxembourg, Switzerland are all going to start to change that discussion right across a border where that had not been before. So I don't think that may, it may still be a bear for a year, but just the fact that you now have two, at least two Spanish manufacturers who have been approved by the German government to ship across the border for GMP, that's huge. And I think that that is also gonna have an impact. I, I do believe that on moving the Spanish discussion on regulating the industry, because again, you know, the United States has different models working. Uh, you know, in Colorado, it was a voter referendum that changed the law. In Germany, it was actually a patient lawsuit that triggered the legislation. So while I think it's a different model, it's, mm. it, there is definitely, I think, a place for consumer action or you know, industry action. Because mm -hmm. I think it does impact some.
Mm-hmm. That's the can irony of the too? EU too. Is the idea that you know we can sell it to Germany, but we can't you know we can't sell it locally. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like, that makes absolutely uh, no sense. As long as it's not in our country, we're okay. And then, uh, by the way, we have another system that we don't want to mess with because everybody's happy with it. Sorry. Oh, by the way, you know the the Swiss uh, the Swiss federal government have just uh, given on the twentieth twentieth of June. They told uh, the parliament now to prepare for modifying the law on narcotic substances, and one of the elements in that is to allow exports. From Switzerland of uh, medical cannabis products. <laughs> to your point. <laughs> we will allow but exports, also, but, but not grown but, here, right? <laughs> no, no, actually in in the in uh, also that's included too in the modification, which is great news for people doing medical cannabis now because it means that um, uh, when uh, it, the doctors and the patients uh, they no longer will have to apply for uh, special permissions, uh, like end, end of life therapies, palliative care, you know, um, special circumstances for the use of medical cannabis. And, and now going forward, probably from next year, the, or maybe mid next year, um, medical cannabis can be prescribed like an antibiotic or like a, a regular drug uh, in the Swiss market. So then the responsibility is on the doctors and their patients. And, well, and what do the doctors think of that? Are, are they on board with that, the or are they are opposed favor, to it? Favor? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the doctors. Um, yeah, a sec. Yeah, on this, because the Swiss government they carried out a consultation process that lasted all of last year, and I was looking at the the results of it of the process, and um, let's see. Uh, the pharmacists voted unanimously in favor. Mm-hmm. So all the pharmacy associations yeah. and the uh, doctors also. There were some uh, questions about um, uh, overall. It was in favor. It was vast, It was overall in favor. So it's going. It's going forward for the modification. Yeah. But there were, there were only one or two people who had some reserves. That's all. How about, how about insurance companies and pharma? How many what? How about insurance companies and pharma? Did they vote? In so favor? insurance, insurance uh, in the modification of the law uh, that's going forward now in Switzerland, um, it doesn't talk about um, reimbursements yet. That's going to be dealt with in 2021. Okay. And, right. and so pharma? they want to first uh, evaluate the economic advantage to the healthcare system. And that's one thing. And also they want to uh, have the verification that um, allowing now the free prescription, free, you know, it's still under the responsibility of a doctor um, and the dispensing of a pharmacist. Um, they want to see if it truly is bringing um, a good benefit uh, from a, a medical therapeutic uh, point of view to the to the patients in Switzerland. Last year, the the Swiss um, Ministry of uh, Health they issued more than three thousand uh, special authorizations, and that's been rising every year. So it's gotten to the point where it's no longer a special need. But now it's now it's recognized as a general need of the population, so it should be um, dispensed, prescribed, and dispensed as a regular drug. And are they targeting pain management, epilepsy? Are there specific areas that yes. they're targeting? Uh, oh, um, in the, in the in the modification, they I'm not sure if there's a, is, is any limitation, but it is today used for that. Yes. It is used for pain management, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy. Uh, there, there is a list of, I, I know many doctors and pharmacists here prescribing for those um, ailments. Mm-hmm. Is there any serious thoughts about um, any of your products having THC in the future? Is it hinging on what's happening in Luxembourg? Is it hinging on, on pie in the sky? Yeah. Or? That's, still, that's still, well, you know, there was some time, you know, Switzerland, was kind of one of the front runners in Europe for its um, more, I would say, advanced um, 
way of managing uh, drugs in the, in the country because they don't look upon it as a crime per se. They look at upon, they look upon it as a as a as a, as a you know, maybe a psychological disorder or a need by the person or a, more of a medical problem rather than a crime. So that's always been historically the, the Swiss approach. So it's more a tolerant approach, yeah, and trying to find help for the person, right? So um, I, I think uh, going forward, Switzerland will want to try and regain some of its former status uh, as being uh, in the avant garde of uh, how. Uh, especially cannabis products are being regulated. Yes. So we and are actually down to three minutes. I'd like to throw out one more opportunity um, for anybody to ask a question. C can I actually yeah, add a little ahead. thing to the previous Please. conversation about yes. uh, the difference between the American and the European approach? Because um, if you look at the history of the development of things like GMP applied to pharmacy, or quality systems and certifications applied to food and, and cosmetics, um, there's a sort of a fundamental difference in the approach between Europe and, and US. In the US, the, the responsibility, a lot of the responsibility, I won't say all, but a lot of the responsibility is placed on the regulatory authority to control the operator. And this is why you always see the FDA coming out with all their notices every practically a weekly basis. In Europe, it's not like that. In Europe, the is primarily placed on the operator, and it's the operator that has to demonstrate compliancy. And then they get checked by the regulatory authorities. And then if there is a, uh, an inconsistency in labeling or formulation or non-compliancy, then they get uh, a notice to, um, to resolve it, right? That's, so it's a complete different approach, sure. the, the way responsibility is handled between the two, the two continents. And that, that is... That's that my is two cents. Well, that is, that is, of course, an invitation to another Clearly Cannabis. You know that we would love to have you back. There is so much that we could ask you. You are always a wealth of information. And thank you thank for sharing you, everything for, so far today. Um, we are going to take a little bit of a summer break.